Good morning. Thank you for joining us here in person and online. Uh, my name is Norbert Michel. I'm Vice President and Director for Cato's Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. Uh, we'll have opening remarks from Congressman Rose in just a bit, and uh, then we will follow that up with our panel, which is moderated by Fox News's Kat Timph. Congressman Rose will take just one, maybe two questions at most, uh, and then our panel will take a few as well, both from the audience here and online, and you know, depending on how that works out. Uh, we're, we are going to be on a pretty tight schedule because of our guest work and travel demands, uh, so I want to ask up front for the Q&A portion, please, please briefly state a question, uh, just a question, make sure it's a question, if you would, and if you could make it related to the policy topic, please. Uh, for the online audience, you can join the conversation and submit questions directly on the event webpage, Facebook, YouTube, and on Twitter using hashtag CatoEcon. Our first speaker this morning is Representative John Rose from Tennessee. He's represented the sixth district of his state in the U.S. House since 2019. He serves on the House Financial Services Committee. He's on several subcommittees, including financial institutions and monetary policy, and he's been named the vice chairman of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. And directly related to our event, late last year he introduced the Bank Privacy Reform Act, uh, a bill that would make a major change to the Bank Secrecy Act. And with that, please help me welcome Congressman John Rose. Thank you and good morning. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and, and I'd like to begin by thanking the Cato Institute for hosting this wonderful event. Kat Temp for hosting or moderating today's discussions and our panelists, uh, Norbert Mike, uh, Michelle, Jennifer Schulp, and Aaron Klein for participating in today's discussion. Let's give all of them a round of applause. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank all of those in attendance today and who are joining us either in person or virtually. When I'm giving remarks back home in Tennessee, I always begin by saying it's an honor to represent the good people of Middle Tennessee. And while that's still true today, uh, it is also a privilege to advocate for the people in this audience, either physically present with us here today or via the internet, who are similarly interested in protecting and restoring our fundamental right to personal privacy. For those unaware, uh, I am currently serving in my third term in Congress, and I've been in the, uh, had the privilege, privilege and honor of serving on the House F Committee on Financial Services for all three terms. Most recently, I was proud to be asked to uh, serve on the House Committee on Agriculture, so now I have two committee assignments and a lot less free time. Within the Financial Services Committee, as has already been, men has, has already been mentioned, I serve on three sub subcommittees, uh, the, the Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions Subcommittee, which has jurisdiction over banks and the banking regulators, the newly formed committee, Subcommittee on Digital Assets, and I'm also Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations which I believe will be playing an instrumental role in holding the Biden administration accountable uh, in this new Republican majority. One of my priorities has been and will continue to be providing the necessary congressional oversight to ensure financial regulators do not overstep and use their authority to strangle our banks and Main Street businesses. On the administrative front, this has been one of the most ambitious and aggressive expansions of the regulatory apparatus in history, certainly in my lifetime. Since President Biden's inauguration day, just barely over two years ago, his administration has finalized 570 new regulations that cost the economy an amazing $359.9 billion and resulting in 224.4 million hours of additional paperwork for our American businesses. We've also witnessed a great deal of mission creep 
at the regulatory agencies, particularly with regard to climate and social issues. When I meet with stakeholders in the financial sector, as well as in other industries for that matter, they tell me that unelected bureaucrats are trying to mandate so-called best practices for running their businesses, including telling them where they can operate, what products they can offer, and whether or not they can expand and grow their operations. It's gotten so bad that the SEC has been acting more like the Social and Environment Commission than the Securities and Exchange Commission. In addition to being an eighth generation farmer, a small business owner, and a recovering lawyer, I, am, I previously served on the board of First National Bank of Tennessee. That experience has guided my views on the dire need to reform our anti-money laundering laws. Personally, I think the entire system is set up wrong. We basically deputize banks as law enforcement agencies, mandating them to collect information on their customers and report that information to the federal government. Then, to add insult to injury, after requiring banks to go to that time and expense, the federal government essentially refuses to provide feedback to those same banks as to whether or not the information that they were forced to provide is even utilized. During my time at First National Bank of Tennessee, I spent countless hours reviewing suspicious activity reports and currency transaction reports and never was I given feedback from the regulators. In fact, they don't even tell members of Congress whether this information is in fact useful. I've been trying to get answers on this issue and no one seems to have a clue. Go figure. In the case of non-bank ATM operators or automated teller machine operators, the anti-money laundering framework has failed them as well. For those of you who, not, who are not aware, a previous iteration of the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council's Bank Secrecy Act and Anti-Money Laundering Manual, now that's a mouthful, also known as the BSA AML Manual, labeled the entire non-bank ATM industry as high risk. And many banks won't bank the owners of these businesses or these businesses even till this day, even though the FFIEC has revised their manual and issued a statement telling banks not to treat them as high risk. Now, getting that change took months of work from a group of bipartisan members of Congress, including former Representative Carolyn Maloney, Representative Blaine Lukemeyer, and myself. Last year, I met with the acting director of FinCEN, Him Doss, and I asked him for data on the number of successful prosecutions that have been brought against ATM operators over money laundering concerns and the total number of cash withdrawals from the independently owned ATMs in a given year that they could verify represented laundered funds. Now remember, they labeled this entire industry as high risk. He couldn't provide me with any of that information, not even one instance. In fact, no one in the federal government seems to have access to this information. So this begs the question, what is the point of the current system? All of this to say, our anti-money laundering regulations are undoubtedly out of whack and have real world consequences, including when it comes to our personal privacy. That is why today I am reintroducing the Bank Privacy Reform Act, which keeps the Bank Secrecy Act's record keeping requirements intact, but prevents the government from accessing consumers' transaction history without first obtaining a warrant, thus statutorily restoring the Bill of Rights protections that we were granted under the Fourth Amendment and that I dare say most Americans probably think are being safeguarded on a day-to-day -day basis. Today, the Fourth Amendment is more important than ever. With the growth of technology and the increasing use of surveillance and data collection, our privacy is, is constantly under threat. We live in a world where our every move can be tracked, where our personal information can be easily accessed by third parties, and where the government has unprecedented powers of surveillance. 
In recent years, we have seen many cases where the Fourth Amendment has been critical in protecting the rights of individuals. Cases like Riley v. California, which held that the police must obtain a warrant before searching a suspect's cell phone. And Carpenter v. United States, which established some limitations on the government's ability to obtain cell phone location data without a warrant. Now, I told you earlier, I've been trained as a lawyer historically, a recovering lawyer, I said, but I dare say that we see as technology advances that it always seems that the government thinks that because new technology is involved, that our sacred rights protected under the Constitution, like the Fourth Amendment, should be thrown out the window. And that is simply not the case. The law is developing in these areas to protect individuals' right to privacy, but it's still lagging behind in the financial sector. The Fourth Amendment is a vital part of our legal system, and it is critical to protecting our individual rights and freedoms. It ensures that the government cannot invade our privacy without a warrant and without showing probable cause to gain one, and it provides us with protections against unwarranted searches and seizures. As Americans, we must ensure that we continue to protect our individual freedoms for ourselves as well as the generations to come. So with that, I will just end by saying that it is a pleasure again to be here and please encourage your member of Congress or any other member or member's office with whom you have a close working or personal relationship to join me in this effort to reestablish our right to privacy by co-sponsoring the Bank Privacy Reform Act. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me or my office and staff if we can assist you or you would like to know more about my legislation. Thank you and thanks for having me here. Happy to take a question or two. We do have time for just one or two questions if anybody has one uh, online or in the audience. If we wanna go, here we go. Please state your name and affiliation. David Burton, the Heritage Foundation. Ah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I think you were absolutely right in identifying the lack of data and information about this entire system as a central problem. And FinCEN is one of the most opaque agencies in the federal government. So it strikes me that one of the things that we should do is force FinCEN to actually provide information to policymakers about uh, how much good the AML system is doing and also about the cost of the AML system on, on the private sector. And, uh, but no one in Congress has introduced a bill mandating that FinCEN provide information about prosecutions that arise out of uh, reporting or forcing FinCEN or an independent agency to do costs. And this is sort of good government, it's not something sexy, but it would lay the factual predicate for reform. I was wondering if, if you thought you and your colleagues on the committee would be open to such a thing. Well, thank you, uh, David, thank you for that question. And absolutely, I think you're on the right track. Um, I, I think the reality is that FinCEN doesn't know. I don't think the current system has a feedback loop coming from law enforcement to give them the kind of visibility they need in order to actually provide that reporting. So I think what we're seeing right now is just anecdotal evidence of whether or not all of this mountain of data that is being collected by our financial institutions, our private financial institute, or our private financial transactions, data regarding those, is actually being useful. And that's why we then don't see a feedback loop to the banks. So the task that, and some of you in this room or those listening may have shared this experience, as a bank uh, director, you have personal liability for whether or not you're reporting uh, the suspicious activity of customers in your bank. And so it becomes a very real task for bank directors to, to scrutinize those reports and make sure that the reports are being made, and yet there's never any feedback, um, I dare say. And, and so, you know, you, you're kind of throwing a dart in the dark with a blindfold on, hoping that maybe what you're providing is adequate, and hoping that 
in the rearview mirror someday, some member of law enforcement doesn't identify some transaction that you failed to report that they now believe should have been reported. And, that, and that's the fear that drives most financial institutions. And so they have you know, legions of people poring over the transactions that happen every day, trying to identify which ones might be relevant, which ones might should be reported, but they really have no guidance coming back from the law enforcement community about whether or not their past reports have been useful, about whether the continuing reports in many cases that they're filing are, are in fact warranted or useful to law enforcement. And so I think there has to be a reporting requirement back from law enforcement of some sort or we need to introduce some sort of, and this is the idea that I'm fond of, introduce some sort of market forces to the equation. You know, today, we all pay for all of this through the costs of our financial services that we secure from financial institutions. The government's not paying for it. Law enforcement is not paying for it. But if you think about it, if a law enforcement officer wants to undergo or undertake an investigation, and if that investigation ultimately leads to securing a warrant, there's a cost to that in terms of resources of the agency, of the prosecutors. Uh, when it comes to getting financial data, there's no cost for them. So of course they want as much as they can get, whether or not they use it or not. And as we have seen, we've certainly seen anecdotal evidence at least, that, that oftentimes they just go on fishing expeditions, looking through this data, hoping to find something that might be helpful to them. So, I, I very much believe there's interest in that, and, and I'm personally interested in it. Thank you very much. Thank please, you. please join me in a round of applause. <laughs> and now we are going to move to our panel discussion, which includes me. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> And my colleague, Jennifer, uh, Director of Financial Regulation here at Cato, and Aaron Klein, who is a uh, economics fellow at Brookings, and our moderator, Fox News' Kat Temp. All right, so I, I think that the government is very successful overall at making things super murky and difficult to understand, or, you know, people they just kind of tune it out. Um, if you were explaining, you know, what is the Bank Secrecy Act to someone and why they should care, kind of how would you do that to just an average person who maybe isn't as into policy <laughs> as a lot of us here are? I can take this one. Uh, I, I think of it as two pieces. So you've got a, a record keeping requirement and a reporting requirement. Record keeping, kind of like it sounds, financial institutions have to keep records. It's not just banks, I'll throw that in there. Uh, all kinds of different companies fall under the financial institution name. So it's pawn shops, car dealers, jewelers, uh, broker dealers, all kinds of financial companies. And then the reporting part, that's the kicker. Um, there are many different pieces to that, but basically these financial institutions have to report your financial transaction data to the federal government. And again, there's many different pieces to that, but uh, one part of this is that uh, unlike if the police were to come to your home, they would have to have a warrant. They would have had to have shown a judge probable cause that you have committed a crime, that they think that you may have committed a crime, in order to get a warrant to go and search your papers and your property. That's not the case with the financial transaction data. The financial institutions have to give that, have to report that stuff to the law enforcement agencies without them having to get the warrant first. Um, that's why you should care in addition to the cost that it, impl that it, it imposes on financial institutions to comply with. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, people like to say the whole, well, if I'm not doing anything wrong, you know, why do I care? I, I, I'm not running any kind of crime ring, but I, like, I still don't want anybody to know what I'm buying on Amazon. I feel like that's just, it, very, very personal, far too personal, but what the government says, which is how they justify a lot of these things and um, people agreeing or sort of just compli being compliant, complacent about privacy laws is that, you know, terrorism, safety, if you don't do this, you won't be safe. Um, so Aaron, I'm, I'm gonna go to you on this. I know that, Congressman, you alluded to this, that people can't really give you any examples of, oh, we have to allow this because otherwise all these people would have died here. Like, we're not really seeing that. Um, and then. How does the money wasted and the you know, loss of privacy compare to the actual safety that we're getting in return? So, so uh, 
Um, let me touch on that with two things. First, I'm going to tell you somebody who's in jail right now for anti-money laundering. Okay. <laughs> Former Speaker of the House, Denny Hastert. Denny Hastert allegedly molested boys when he was a high school gym teacher, I think in the 70s. Now, whether that's true or false, not been proven in a court of law, but what was proven in a court of law was that he kept taking out $9,990 every month to pay this kid who had been his high school teacher and whose family made this allegation. Now, why $9,900? Well, you know, most people uh, who engage in, in, in financial services with a lot of money, and even some people in the common world know there's this $10,000 transaction limit that was set in the 1960s, right. unindexed for inflation, a point I hope we get back to. Mm -hmm. Part of the law also says you can't just get around the law by constantly withdrawing $9,999. That's called structuring. That's what Denny Hastert did. That's what the situation did on the Jersey Shore, also in jail for a combination of anti-money laundering and tax evasion. He would get money from DJ gigs he did in Vegas and ask, instead of getting $15,000, can I get a check for $9,900 and $5,100 and try and avoid paying taxes? Remember, he was the smartest guy on the Jersey Shore. Right, yeah. Which is why he knew about the $10,000 limit. Yeah. And he was on the Jersey Shore, which is why he thought he could get away with it with right. this scheme. So now, look, I'm not saying, you know, the, the situation and Denny Hastert don't deserve to be in jail. But what I am saying is the crimes for which they're in jail are not are, are a different set of crimes. Second point. Let's talk about whether these things make us more or less safe. If I were to have to explain the Bank Secrecy Act, I would start with that banks are required to know their customer, know your customer, KYC. Banks can bank criminals. There's nothing that says you can't bank a criminal. In fact, part of the goal of it is to use the data you get from banking criminals to find out the criminals by tracking the money. So part of the, there's a push-pull tension to keep criminals out of the banking system versus keep them in so we can catch them. This gets to the issue of cannabis, which to me is a huge glaring insanity in our current system. Banks can bank cannabis entities. They just have to file an inordinate amount of reports, and if they make any mistake on this report, the bank can be liable. Now, as a result, most banks don't want to touch these right. companies. Thus, they have to deal in cash. Guess what happens when you have a lot of cash and weed in a location? Right. Crime. People are getting shot. People, they're murders. They're all these things because we're pushing an entire industry. For what purpose? If you want to find out, if Uncle Sam wants to come and raid a cannabis shop, there's a really useful tool out there for them. It's called Google Maps. Mm -hmm. I suggest that you get on Google Maps and you'll find all the weed stores you yeah. want. But instead, we're requiring banks to spend all this money reporting information on where these weed stores are, right? And correspondingly, keeping a lot of banks away, putting cash on the weed stores, and then creating crime, making us all less safe. Right, even though the, 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 it's just because the banks are so concerned about, oh, I might miss something. <laughs> uh, one, it's really expensive to file all these reports. Of course, and two, if you, assuming. right, and, and so you're like, look, you know, I mean, a lot of banks, the few banks that offer this will charge 10,000 bucks a month if you want a bank account. Yeah, and you, uh, you know, you mentioned to the, the level of, it's never been adjusted for inflation. The 10,000 would be about 72,000 today. Why is that, they, they've never changed that. 10,000 and $72,000, are a very different amount of money. I don't, I don't know if you guys uh, can, can like, what, I, what you can buy with 72,000, what you're doing if, when that comes into your account is very different than what you're doing when 10,000 comes into your account. Yeah, you know, your income was not, our income in, on average is not what it was uh, you know, now. Right. And back then, if you had $72,000, you could buy two new Corvettes. Yeah. You're not gonna do that with $72,000 now. No. So that, like, that's how much that's changed uh, in terms of our standard of living, but they haven't adjusted that one at all. Right. Th th this is the pernicious mission creep of unindexed numbers. I'm an economist, so I'll be a little geeky here, right? You index numbers to inflation to try and keep the original intent. The intent of the law in the 60s was to catch the mafia and tax evasion of real large, large dollar amounts. Remember, Al Capone didn't go to jail for running the mob, right? He went to jail for tax evasion. But they didn't index the number. And the unindexed number from the 60s is now trapping a lot of ordinary people. You could have walked 
into Harvard and paid your kids full tuition in cash and not triggered a report. Yeah. Right? Today, I don't think you could pay for one class. <laughs> no, I don't think you could. Yeah, absolutely. A large dinner, probably. <laughs> like you couldn't. Um, you don't want to use cash. No, oh, no, absolutely. Now, I mean, so basically, you know, the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to financial records. To me, that, you know, seems insane for a lot of reasons. I mean, if, if one amendment doesn't matter, then none of them kind of do. That's always my issue. But also, um, it, it clearly doesn't because probable cause, I mean, having a bank account is not probable cause. H how did this s sort of happen like this? No, I'll play lawyer on the yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. today. Uh, maybe recovering, maybe not. I'm not <laughs> sure. Um, but in the in the 1970s, there were two Supreme Court cases about the Bank Secrecy Act. For for the lawyers in the room, that's California Bankers Association v. Schultz, and United States v. Miller. And those cases took a look at whether this type of reporting system was constitutional. And the United States v. Miller found that the Fourth Amendment didn't apply because when you give your information to a third party, here, you're giving your information to the bank, you lose the expectation of privacy over it. So the government doesn't have a responsibility to protect your privacy because you already told your information to the bank. Well, A, I think that was specious when the Supreme Court decided it in the first place in 1976, and Thurgood Marshall agreed with me, um, yeah. as did several other justices raised questions about this in the 1970s. But as the time's gone on since the 1970s, you really can't do much in modern American society without giving your information to a third party to make right. it happen. You can't use a debit card. You can't use your bank account. You can't use the internet. Right. So this whole, what's known as the third party doctrine is, is incredibly problematic for the concept of the Fourth Amendment applying to protect our privacy today. A couple of current Supreme Court justices have raised this issue, um, and you'd be interested to know it's Justice Sonia Sotomayor and Justice Neil Gorsuch, who don't agree on a lot, um, but they've both raised the problem that this third-party doctrine is really a problem for the Fourth Amendment um, in modern times. Hopefully the Supreme Court gets back to it, but there's nothing stopping Congress from saying, hey, this is a constitutional problem. We need to fix this law to make sure that the Fourth Amendment's balance is in place for this type of reporting or transaction keeping. Yeah, I mean, without the bank account, you have the two options of living in the woods with it like an arsenal of weapons and killing and eating your own food, or Aaron, as you mentioned, the you know house full of cash <laughs> in the mattress, which leads to many of its own problems and associated lifestyle. So that is to be said, you really have no choice. It's not like you're electing to ha be a person with a bank account. And that was brought up back in those cases, during those cases too. So it's only gotten worse, but it wasn't as though that wasn't a thing then. Um, that was especially with Marshall. Yeah, and we're seeing it's not just a problem that applies in the financial privacy space. We're seeing it with respect to cell phone records. We're seeing yes. it with respect to location records. Um, so the Supreme Court's been kind of chipping away at some of these issues, but they really have not had the opportunity yet to tackle it in the financial privacy space, which is, I think, one of the most important privacy spaces. Absolutely. Given that, as you said, if the one amendment doesn't apply, what's the deal yeah. with the rest of them? This doesn't just implicate people's Fourth Amendment rights. It implicates people's First Amendment rights to speech and expression. It implicates people's Fifth Amendment rights. There's, there's so much of the constitutional amendments that, that apply here not just the fourth. Yeah. And if I could go back on that one, just, just go back to and tie, and tie this in to something you said, you know, a lot of people will just say, well, I mean, if you're not doing anything wrong, what's the big deal, right? Like, yeah. it's no big deal. Well, that's actually not uh, the way it was looked at when the Bill of Rights was put in place. And the idea, truthfully, is the opposite. It's if you're not doing anything wrong, there's no reason for them to have it. This, we're talking yeah. about giving people power, other people power over people. And in history, that's tended not to work out so well. So this is a protection for that. And we've watered down that protection. Mm -hmm. so, so if I can, I can actually flip the argument on its head, right? Which is like, one of the ways this, this situation is popular 
is it's about catching bad guys. Right. Right. And no, who here is for the bad guy? <laughs> right. But flip it on its head. If the goal is to catch bad people by looking through financial records, right, you have to, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Yeah. So if you're going to look for a needle in the haystack, the first thing is probably stop dumping more hay. Yeah. <laughs> and the system is on autopilot, forever producing more and more and more records, right? Because again, if you're a, ba if you're a financial institution, right, what, what you're being judged is how many records are you going to produce? Right. Not whether the records are good, not whether they're helpful, not whether they're useful, right? So your incentive structure is produce more records, dump the hay, dump the hay, dump the hay. Mm -hmm. And this actually makes it harder for law enforcement to catch people. The second issue is you have to prioritize who are we going after, right? You can't boil the ocean for everybody. And this is what I kind of got to is, you know, the, 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 when they originally passed the law, the goal was to go after the mafia, bad guys, right? Then in the 80s, it was a war on drugs. And we're going to go after the drug cartels, different form of bad guys. Then after 9-11, we're going to go after terrorists, new form of bad guys, mm -hmm. right? So what is it? Because trying to figure out how a terrorist cell is moving money is very different than trying to figure out how a drug cartel is moving money is very different than trying to figure out how the mafia is moving money, right? All bad guys, who's the worst? Who's the priority, right? Now we have cannabis folks caught up in this, right? We have other people caught up in this. And so I would say that even if you're you're not as concerned or bought into the arguments on privacy and individual liberty which are you know compelling in their own right but in a different framework if you want to make the system more effective for catching bad guys let's prioritize who the bad guys are focus our limited number of resources because there are a limited number of people looking at all these reports and then tell the financial institutions we really want to catch x i want to go after human traffickers Right. And then the banks will get that mission, and start to prioritize and file fewer reports of higher quality as opposed to more reports of innocuous behavior. Right. It is. It's, it's not hard to see how having to go through every single thing, you're not having a focus. It would be like if they were looking for a murderer and, you know, stopping every single car on the road and then, OK, go to the next. You would never find that person. Um, and then the bad guys can also be you know, they can get very creative with that. We saw something like that happen in Canada with people who donated money to, you know, the trucker protests. That's not a drug cartel, but they were essentially treated like one. That's right. And this is, and this is a democratic, otherwise democratic government. Right. This isn't like, uh, you know, would expect something in China, maybe like you expect something like that to happen. Uh, you're supposed to have the right to protest your government and in Canada and in the United States. And when this happened, I know we did a lot of media hits here um, talking about that issue in Cato, and people would say, well, you know, that, that, that can't happen in the United States, which I was, find it kind of amusing in a bad way because we're right there. It's already right there. All the, the framework is in place to do that. Uh, people, um, when the Ukrainian-Russian conflict took off, a lot of United States citizens who had ties either just family ties or business ties to people in Russia had their bank accounts frozen, even if some temporarily. Uh, but, but that's the point. It's this giant dragnet, and it could be used in a much worse way than it's being used. Well, and I think, just to add to that, that there's a lot of kind of everyday ways that this type of system denies people access to financial services. Yes. So even if you are very sure that the government is not going to decide that what you're doing is bad somewhere down the line. That's right. <laughs> the and, and I don't think you should be sure about you that. You can never be sure of that. <laughs> but no, even if all, you don't. are oh. against all odds, very sure. This the Bank Secrecy Act has a lot of downstream effects on people's ability to access financial services. So you have people that don't want to be in the system because they don't want to give up this information to the government, which is a fair, a fair reason not to want to be in the system. But I think you kind of turn back to the examples that Congressman Rose was giving about ATMs um, and how that kept a lot of independent ATMs from being accessible to people because they couldn't be banked. We see it in border areas where the Bank Secrecy Act requirements make it so that banks don't want to deal with populations that might want to send a lot of money to their family in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So we see fewer and fewer bank branches in areas that serve immigrant populations. And that it's in and of itself is a problem even if you think 
that the government is going to do everything good with the information that it gets. So there, there's a lot of reasons yeah, and a lot costs. of costs. Yeah, yeah abs absolutely. And you know, that obviously there has to be some kind of balance. For me, that is quite obviously the Fourth Amendment, because <laughs> um, people do want to feel safe. But it's, it's it's kind of hard to to get that message out there when it is so effective in every single area. I mean. TSA, like I got, I, when I was finding out, I got the select, randomly selected groping. And like, I guess what, no bomb, you know? And, and despite all the statistics there and the statistics here, people have a really hard time with them and, until it's like too late and it happens to you kind of a thing, unfortunately. Um, yeah. um, but you know, they say, some people say that this is this vital piece of national security. Um, you know, that there's all these different actions and, 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 and again, it, it, I think it's actually a very good comparison between the security s stuff after 9-11 and this of how effective it's actually been. But what they also have in common is that they're both still going. Yeah, <laughs> no, for sure. And that's why I think, uh, you know, Congressman Rose deserves a lot of credit for having, excuse me, the courage to, to introduce a bill like he has, um, because th this is, it, 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 it's uh, unfortunate is the word I'm looking for. It's unfortunate that we would have to say that he's so courageous to say, hey, actually, let's, let's take care of the Fourth Amendment. Right. Uh, but, but that's where we are. And uh, Aaron? So it's, it, it's not just going. It's getting worse because we have these yes. unindexed yes. thresholds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, uh, I, I was uh, uh, talking with, with, with Nick Anthony, another scholar in the field, when I got here, and he reminded me I did this piece when I worked at the Bipartisan Policy Center that looked at what the number was, $10,000 index for inflation in like 2016. And one of the findings was back then for the median worker, right, the 50th percentile Joe six-pack average American earned the, for the entire year $9,600. So they, if they got paid their entire year in cash, saved it all up and brought it to the bank, wouldn't be a report. Yeah. Right? Now, when I published the paper in, in, uh, back in 2016, you could, for the average American, you could earn through St. Patrick's Day. Now, I haven't looked, but inflation's got a lot worse in the last six years since then. Yes. And it wouldn't shock me if today's the day, end of February, that your average annual earnings would trigger a report. Now, has the policy meant, has, the, has there been a conscious decision in policy that we want to be filing reports on people using two months worth of wages, which is about, what, what is that? That's the typical for an engagement ring, yeah. right? <laughs> so we've gone from the guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so we've gone from a year's worth of wages not triggering a report to two months of wages triggering a report with no conversation that that's what we want to do as a society simply because we put an unindexed number into law, pressed autopilot, and never made a change. And I think that's a really important point. I'll say it's not just inflation that's doing the, the kind of dirty work on this, though. There's been continual expansions of the Bank Secrecy Act since 1970. Um, we saw a recent one in 2020 um, where, the, where Congress passed a bill that now requires companies to report who their owners are to FinCEN, which is the Department of Treasury that takes care of this. Um, so you can't anonymously own a company anymore. Um, there's a lot of reasons that you might want to. Um, you might be running a business that you think someone doesn't want you to run, um, or that the government might not be thrilled with your running it. Well, Congress in 2020 said, no, that's not okay. You, you need to tell FinCEN who you are, and FinCEN's gonna keep a giant database of that. Um, that's been a mess for any number of reasons, including the rules that FinCEN has proposed on that. But this is also not the end of kind of expansions of the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, we say we talk a lot about crypto these days, um, and your kind of standard crypto company who is doing an exchange or, or working in that space is already subject as a financial institution to the Bank Secrecy Act. 
But Senator Warren and Senator Marshall uh, proposed a new bill uh, a couple of weeks ago where they would apply the Bank Secrecy Act to peer-to-peer -to -peer crypto transactions. So the equivalent of handing cash to someone in the crypto world, yeah. um, which would be a massive expansion and a very different system than is set up for the Bank Secrecy Act now, where you're looking at intermediaries. There, there is no intermediary. Right. It's just you and someone else sending crypto to each other. So I inflation is doing a lot of dirty work here, but, but Congress has really continued to expand where the Bank Secrecy Act kind of gets its tentacles into, making sure that your life is under, your financial life is under surveillance. Um, yeah, no, and when, I mean, when they started, we had two major reports, two main reports, and now there's more like 10. You have thresholds all across the board for the different types of reports. None of them were indexed for inflation. Uh, the SAR, the Suspicious Activity Report, which is probably, I think, the most dastardly one, you know, that didn't even come into play until 92. Um, the, the law was passed in 92, the regulation was 95, 96. So that's, that, that's requiring financial institutions to report people for suspicious crim, uh, criminal activity, literally. Yeah, and then of course, Patriot Act. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. In addition to all of the other things that it's impacted in terms of all our civil liberties, it had an impact on, on uh, BSA as well. Yes, you had a, ma a major expansion uh, in 2001 with the Patriot Act. All the formal KYC stuff that Aaron was talking about, customer due diligence, KYC, all of that was formalized in 01. Um, and, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to make a value judgment, but I mean, 9-11 happened with a massive BSA, Bank Secrecy Act regime already in place. and and those transactions just didn't happen to catch anybody. Right, so, so but th this gets to that kind of earlier point I was trying to make about what's the point of the system, right? Right. The point of the right. system can't be everything, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority, right? Right. And the original intent of the system was to catch large operations conducting wide-scale crime that was generating profit, right? There's crime that generates money as profit, and then there's crime that is just crime, right? right. Those are two different types of criminal behavior. Right, so the mafia, the drug cartels, right? If you think about it, there's a lot of crime going on in America generating illegal gotten money that's often then being shipped overseas, right? The money has to go back to the drug cartels, back to the mafia, right? Extremely different than, than Al Qaeda. That was a very different network of moving money around for very different purposes. If society wants to change what the primary focus is because new threats are, that makes sense. I was in Congress during 9-11. Al-Qaeda felt a lot more of a threat than Pablo Escobar, mm -hmm. right? And I think most Americans changed their threat assessment on September 12th, and Congress responded. But okay, that means you have to deprioritize the last thing if you're going to reprioritize the next. And that's a situation where I think we've kind of struggled because nobody wants to say, well, let's deprioritize this. Right. To the point where we're now in insanity yeah. when it comes to the war on drugs and AML. Because we have these state-licensed cannabis places everywhere, and we have this reporting requirement that's still predicated on the fact that these are illegal operations generating inordinate amount of paperwork that's completely unnecessary, huge cost to the financial system, debanking de one group of people, in the end making crime worse, which is the original purpose of the whole thing. Yeah. And they've acknowledged that it's making crime worse. They've acknowledged that it's made criminals harder to catch because of this hay effect. You know, right, right. Like that's, it's not us, it's, this isn't us, our opinion. This is, this is actually an objective statement that the agencies themselves have actually come out and affirmed. I mean, do you think that when this was in first enacted that they uh, assumed that this would happen or worried that this would happen? Uh, r rather than, like you said, prioritize things that are actual issues. Be like, okay, we'll just add more and more, but we're still going to go just as much after these people that were this concern from decades ago while this adding this concern and this concern. And then apparently, like, some dude gives another dude crypto. I mean, that's just absurdly massive. Oh, no, no. You're literally millions, <laughs> yeah, tens millions, and tens yes. of millions of reports and a, maybe a couple thousand a year prosecutions for those actual violations. Right. So, so think of so out of whack. 
w w when the Bank Secrecy Act was passed, was closer to prohibition than it is to today, <laughs> right? So they were living in a world where there'd been this whole back and forth about alcohol, right? And I don't think they were trying to get Anheuser-Busch and Miller Lite filing reports, right? But they'd li they'd lived, that generation had lived through this whole back and forth about whether or not alcohol should be illegal and how would that work out for you. And, and it was a totally different world where they set different amounts. And we've become paralyzed in addressing the substantive concerns, I think in part because nobody wants to be the person who feels like they're being soft on the bad guy, right. when in point of fact, you have to prioritize who the threats are. Yeah, and I think it's important when we think about reform in this area, you're right, no one wants to be soft on the bad guy, and it's, but it's a bad assumption that if these laws were not in place, the bad guy would just roam free. Um, so, uh, banks, even without the Bank Secrecy Act, most legitimate banks have no interest in being known as the terrorist bank. Right. right. Or the bank that, that, oh. that banks the cartel. Yeah. Um, and to the extent that you are a bank that wants to bank the cartel, everyone's going to know that pretty quickly, right. as is law enforcement. Yeah. Right. Uh, so that there's reputational incentives for banks to continue to know their customers, to know the, ba the business that their customers are engaged in. And that, that doesn't go away if you substantially change what the Bank Secrecy Act looks like. So I'm going to push back on that, but in, 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 a, in a different way than, than you might, might expect, which is that you know, there are 5,000 banks in America, and they're banks globally, because BSA is a global reach, right? Non-American banks who are doing business in America still do that. There are a few banks that do want to bank the bad guy, because the bad guy is rich, and you can make a lot of money. And... What you end up with is this weird cost-benefit analysis. I think there was a question earlier about cost-benefit analysis in government, but the corporations are doing cost-benefit analysis. And they say, well, if you're only ever going to fine me, I'll add up the cost of the fine, I'll add up the cost of doing business, and then I'll add up the profits. And if the profits are worth more than the costs, I'm going to continue. And so you see the same banks over and over again getting large fines for violating AML, Right, but what happens in this cost benefit? Then the structure becomes, well, if I'm a little person and the costs aren't worth it and I'm just sending 300 bucks to my family in Mexico or Haiti or somewhere else, I'm just gonna debank all of you. So rather than incentivizing the banks to not, to, 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 to focus on criminal behavior and not bank criminals, what you've incentivized them to do is bank the criminals that are gonna pay the most, right? Who are probably the worst people and, and, and kick out the folks that can't afford to pay the overhead for checking whether or not you're a criminal. No, I, I agree. I mean, I obviously agree with you. I think they're reputational. I think they think that actually provides a strong incentive to not. I mean, terrorism is deeply unpopular, as it should be. I don't think anybody's like, yeah, the terrorist bank, uh, that's my bank. You know, try going to that ATM. <laughs> like, um, but again, as, as you mentioned too, Aaron, and just of how close this was, you know, to prohibition compared to now, there's also, you know, did anybody think, or is anyone really thinking now about now, how many more payments are made electronically than any other way? If I am going into a bank, it's because something's like gone wrong. And like, I, you know, I've, I've been to a bank maybe once in the past two years, or I need something. Everything is done online. It's all electronic, but we haven't really seen any updates, or is anyone anticipating that, or? Actually, some of that was anticipated in those 70s cases. Um, I believe it was Justice Blackman, Blackman, and then maybe one other, who, who were in the majority saying, okay, this is, we're gonna say this is still constitutional under these conditions, but if this goes a little further, if the, if the law is extended, if, <laughs> or if um, uh, technology changes, and, and there's even more of your life sort of in that record, keeping, then this is a problem. And they recognize that problem when people were writing checks. Checks, that's right, that's right. Thurgood Marshall like, you know, said something about, well, if we're gonna make banks photocopy checks, that's a problem. <laughs> like, we're so far beyond photocopying checks. Yeah. I mean, you know, your, your financial records are your life. Yeah.
10 times more at least than, than what it was then. And it's, it's all, I mean, the gut, like they know who I went to brunch with this weekend, you know, because if someone puts the card down and everybody Venmos, I mean, it's all there. There's yeah. so many personal things yeah. about your life that are there. Yeah, you can tell what somebody's, you know, political affiliation is mm-hmm. to an extent or, or where their tendencies are, you know. Um, you tell what, where the political like contributions go. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what they support. Uh, it's all there. We were, we were talking about this last week. I mean, could you imagine in the 1960s? Because so the, the so Bank Secrets Act passed in 1970. I mean, could you just imagine the type of, uh, of of political pressure and political malfeasance you would have seen in the civil rights era? Yeah. Who was the bad guy? Who was the target? You know, somebody who would completely innocent from today's standards, but would have been putting people in power to have that kind of information in the 60s in, in, in a much more tumultuous era. Yeah. You know, we're lucky that we didn't have it then, but it's the same principle now. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's all electronic, all accessible. Um, and then of course, as we talked about, e- extremely expensive, you know, not just for the taxpayer, but I would say also for these institutions and these businesses, correct? Yeah, so, so, so you have to think about how the costs are born, right? The costs are born one, by the financial institutions that have to do all of the reporting. But the financial institutions then absorb some of that cost and losses and, 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 and non-profitability and then pass some on in the cost of a basic banking account. Mm-hmm. So I've long been a critic of the way that our basic banking accounts are structured in America. I think we rely too much on fees, uh, you know, free checking if you have more than a thousand bucks, 10 bucks a month if you have less than a thousand bucks. And if you ever go below zero, boom, overdraft city. Right. That's a that, that's kind of a reverse structure. But you have to say, why do these accounts cost so much money? One of the big drivers of the cost to open an account is this KYC AML response. And it's a flat cost, right? It doesn't matter. You have to know your customer, whether they have 500 bucks in the bank or 5,000 or 50,000 or 500,000. And so if you want to address the cost of makes making basic banking cheaper in America, which I do, you have to start with the premise of what's driving the cost of basing. And a lot of it is this AML. And are we trying to vet people who have a couple hundred bucks, who are trying to make it through, whose accounts are going up and down, right? Are we going after Al Capone, right? Large criminal enterprises. And, and, and I think it's, it gets wrapped up in this broader topic of there's so much regulation. Last point I wanna make is smaller banks in some ways bear the cost disproportionately. This isn't to say that large banks don't bear a tremendous amount of cost, but there's technology and economies of scale that at some degree can be employed that's easier or not quite as easy. And so when you look at smaller banks who talk about the increase in regulation, right, which is just a, it's a refrain talking point, you have to get really specific. What regulation is it? Well, it turns out every year we're having to file more reports because the threshold keeps getting lower in real terms. And, you know, uh, and so that's an area where I think you, you could have a, a, a combining of forces of people on the left that want to bring more low cost basic banking accounts to American consumers, people on the right who are concerned about the civil liberties and the, and the intellectual issues and people in industry who say, this is a huge cost center for me and I'm getting no, nothing back from this, right? This isn't a capital or liquidity regulation which may be making my bank safer or something in the long run, right? This is just the cost of doing business. And I think there's a real area for reform which produces a tremendous amount of winners, mm-hmm. including law enforcement, even though they don't see it, yeah. right? Because you're gonna get less hay. Right, mm-hmm. and law enforcement doing law enforcement's job rather than forcing these institutions to act as law enforcement. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, was, oh. And I just wanted to throw in on those costs, kind of the completely unsexy compliance costs that goes along with it. What we've been talking about are the costs to file the reports, the costs to open the bank account to find out who your customer is. But there's a lot of law and regulation that goes on top of the program that you need to have in place in order to make these things happen. And that even more so than, oh, the bank didn't file this report when it was supposed to, is where the fines come into play, where the regulators second guess, oh, did you, did you have enough people that week looking at the reports? Yeah. Was, was, your, was your compliance <laughs> manual up to date? 
And that, that's a real compliance cost that goes into this mix as well, where your regulator is breathing down your neck about things that if the bank's going to run the program, the bank probably knows how to run the program best, not the regulator. Mm -hmm. But even the second guessing, the resources that need to continually be thrown at this uh, the surveillance, the review, there, there's a lot backing this up, not just some people are looking through transactions and making sure that the paperwork is right. Yeah, how many people would like their business to have, you know, the government come in and say, well, you need to hire 10 more people. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's what they're doing. They do. yeah. we're, we're probably going to have to move to Q&A, Kat. Yes, I saw a uh, <laughs> I think maybe, maybe let's go online and try to engage with some of those folks. So Nick. Uh, so online, we have a ton of questions uh, starting off. As a BSA officer myself, I can see sensible reforms are needed. Across the space, there are financial crimes taking place. So where is the balance of detecting and helping prevent those crimes while protecting personal privacy in an ideal program? So let me, let me try to jump on, on that because there's an area where I think we have a system in place that could catch and stop a lot of bad guys and it's totally not a priority the way it should be, which is elder abuse. So we're having a large number of people more than ever in American history in their 80s, 90s with a lot of money and they are constantly the victim of scam artists calling right nigerian princes and you know you know people online right now this person walks in the bank and says, i need to wire fifty five thousand my fifty thousand dollars to nigeria because this person wrote me this thing online and the bank teller has no legal authority to say no <laughs> right to call their kid that, if their grandma. kid's not on that yeah yeah <laughs> That's not going to work out well for you, right? And this is a huge thing of financial abuse, ripping off elderly people, where we have a system in place to detect it after it happens, in which case, good luck getting your money back, and people's entire life savings are being wiped out. And, you know, situations where if I, if I were in charge of the universe here and directing this BSA officer, I would be like, if you're a state licensed cannabis person, please stop filing paperwork. Period. Stop. Zero. None other than treat you like every other normal business. But I, I want to create a situation where if you think somebody's about to get ripped off before they get ripped off in elder abuse, that there's a structure that allows you to call their kid or, you know, have some sort of conversation or alert somebody because I think that this is a really scary thing that I think would have a huge benefit to society at a relatively reasonable cost. For what it's worth, the securities industry is starting to put that into place. Yeah, if, if, if you go to your broker dealer as opposed to your bank account, which, you know, trying to explain to a person what that pot of money is versus the other is, is challenging, but you're right. I'm saying that, that if you're looking at reforms, there are reforms that are happening in that space and they need to be taken a look at individually, but, but it's not an unrealistic place to think. And then we're dependent on, you know, getting Aaron or somebody like Aaron in as FinCEN director, which I don't think he wants to that's, do. That's the worst thing you've ever wished on me. <laughs> I was joking, Aaron. I, I wouldn't do that to you. Thank you. Nick, do you have another? Uh, yes. Um, so another question that came up was from Kevin. And he's asking, given that government bank account surveillance has today gone well beyond what the Supreme Court originally envisioned when approving the BSA, how likely is it that the Bank Secrecy Act will be overturned by the Supreme Court today? Lawyer. Look, well, the problem with that is you've got to get a case in front of the Supreme Court, which in any sort of issue is always kind of the moonshot. It's very difficult when there's direct Supreme Court precedent on the line so that every lower court can just say, no, 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 we, the Supreme Court already spoke to this, it's, it's okay. Um, so you have to have a very well-funded, very creative thinking legal team with just the right case to get it to the Supreme Court. If this issue ended up in front of the Supreme Court, I think it's it's definitely ripe for review. As I said, I said before, we saw conservative and liberal justices who have questioned the third party doctrine. I think the entire Fourth Amendment is something that the court is interested in at this point. But 
wishing and hoping for the Supreme Court to step in here is probably not the most expedient way of making a change. Uh, Legislation is a much better way route, given the, the difficulties with the judicial system on this front. And, and even that one won't be super quick, as we know, but still quicker. So maybe, maybe do one more? Uh, so one last one. I'll, I'll combine a few to kind of round this out. Some of the concerns that we're seeing today in today's climate is the the $600 reporting requirement for the IRS that was proposed last year, the move towards central bank digital currencies or CBDCs, and just a general kind of giant dragnet approach to financial surveillance. How do these fit into the Bank Secrecy Act? Is that part of a natural expansion or is that something else? Wow. I mean, I think if you ask Janet Yellen, you know, based on some of the remarks that she made with the $600 threshold, she would say it is a natural extension. Um, the, the CBDC thing, that, that takes us into a whole nother world, but I think the interesting thing about it is that they are not disconnected. And it, it's very clear when they talk about setting up a central bank digital currency, um, that has to be compliant with Bank Secrecy Act and AML laws. You know, there. The, to, just to go as quickly as I could with this, the, the, what that is—that central bank digital currency. For those of you not up on that, that's hooking you in in some way, basically directly to the central bank, to be, directly to the Fed. You're not going to get to do business with the Fed if you have an advantage on the Bank Secrecy Act rules. In other words, they're not going to take you in to the Fed at a bar that's even lower than they're going to let you go into a private bank. I mean, that's just not going to happen. So it's very much tied to that. Um, I don't yeah, I just, I mean, I think they're all related in that kind of Americans' complacency with this level of surveillance allows those types of proposals to continue. The Bank Secrecy Act is not top of mind for most average people when they're banking with their bank. Um, I think it should be a little bit more, but but people don't know that these reports are being filed, in part because the reports themselves are confidential. Um, suspicious activity reports are not allowed to be revealed to the subject of the report. Um, so people don't know that this surveillance is happening on a regular basis, which allows continued expansion of the surveillance because people aren't standing up and saying, hey, 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 what about the Fourth Amendment? Hey, hey, I don't want the government knowing this. And they started to with the $600 IRS limit, although I think for people that was more about, hey, hey, that's by taxes. (laughs) But... It did bring some awareness, though. It it brings some awareness. When you see less complacency to the surveillance that we already have, you will see fewer attempts to expand that surveillance. So, one, uh, the history of the law is very much about tax avoidance and about catching people cheating on taxes. So so the two are intertwined. Uh, Number two on the uh, central bank digital currency, allow me to be a prop comic for a second. So... This is a central bank liability. This is the only way that anybody in this room can have a liability of the Federal Reserve. It is cash. And a lot of the Bank Secrecy Act is structured with how we handle and transact cash. If you have more than $5,000, $10,000, there's all these currency thresholds, CTR. There's no other way for any person in this room to have a liability of the central bank. We think that this is the same. This is CBDC. It's commercial bank digital currency. This is not a liability of the central bank. It's a liability of the bank that issues your card, which is never Visa or MasterCard, by the way. I always, people are always like, oh, I owe Visa money. No, you don't, right? This is, a, this is how America runs. We already run on CBDC. Whether or not you want to change the first C from commercial bank to central bank is a very, very deep question. If you are, do have a central bank digital currency, then you have to hold that somewhere in some sort of digital wallet. That digital wallet can either be from a commercial bank, it could be from a non-bank, right? Venmo, PayPal, something like that. Or it could be directly with the central bank itself, a Federal Reserve account. Those are your three choices of things that can hold your digital wallet. All of the three would be subject to some level of Bank Secrecy Act and, and anti-money laundering 
strategy in the way everybody's talked about it, which leads one to a very difficult question, which is who would be fining the Federal Reserve if it was not compliant with anti-money laundering on its very own accounts? That's a good question, Aaron. I think we're going to have to end on that one, I think. Uh, uh, but I will throw in that the central bank, the Fed itself, has been hacked. I'm just saying. Um, so I would please ask you to join me in giving our panel a round of applause. And thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Kat. Thank you all, yes. And please join us for lunch. It's been put out in the foyer. Thank you very much.